presenting your host for the Racecoin podcast, Jay. What's going on, my Racecoin fans? I'm here with Derek Wayne Cope, who's an American professional stock car racing driver and a team manager. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So talk us through your journey. How did you go from being a driver to now a team manager? Well, certainly throughout the years, I've owned my own teams, uh, my own cup team uh, back uh, in 2003. I've owned uh, Xfinity teams, Bush Grand National teams. So uh, obviously I've had, uh, you know, a multitude of of capacities in racing, but primarily been a professional uh, driver, racing driver for, you know, almost 40 years. But uh, really what happened was I was driving for uh, another team and always trying to procure sponsorship. And uh, this gentleman, uh, Mike Kohler, who owned a company, Starcom Fiber, wanted to sponsor me because uh, they had, as kids, they had been uh, you know, fans of mine because their uncle was uh, involved with uh, Main and Tail Shampoo, one of the sponsors that I was involved with when I was with Bobby Allison. So that's really how it all transpired. That's awesome. And, you know, obviously a lot of uh, different roles that you've had over time. How has the pressure been different between the various roles you've played? Well, certainly I've been involved in a lot of things over the years, uh, pretty well-rounded. Uh, basically, I built engines for a living. That was my, my background with my father at his engine rebuilding facility and built my own race cars and, and you know, kind of worked my way up and uh, obviously had to find my own funding. So I was out uh, procuring sponsorship, trying to pitch companies. So I was in the corporate boardroom a lot, uh, speaking engagements, things of those natures, just to try to find funding to help get into Winston Cup racing at that time. So I've done a lot of things. And throughout the years, uh, obviously, I've had a shock absorber company and I've done a lot of things within the racing uh, world. So, you know, and now the pressure itself for me was really trying to be a stable fixture in the sport, uh, trying to get to cup racing, you know, NASCAR cup racing, and then to be a stable fixture for a long period of time. I think that was the, where the pressure came from. So you had to find money, first of all, to showcase your potential. Secondly, you had to be able to go out and be proficient, win races, to stay in the sport, uh, which, you know, you're only as good as your last race. So you really always. continue to, to, to thrive in that kind of a atmosphere. Uh, and I think that's where the pressure really come from, was really trying to perform at the high levels. You're at the highest level of the sport. You're trying to perform against probably the best uh, <clears throat> race car drivers uh, in the world. Uh, you're on a daily basis. And uh, you really just have to, you know, push yourself in pretty much all respects. And I think that's where the pressure came from. You know, obviously owning teams, managing teams, the pressure comes to, to compete and compete uh, as best you can uh, and not settle for mediocrity. Do you feel less in control when you're not behind the wheel or do you feel more in control as a manager? Because obviously, you know, there is more responsibility in some sense. You know, you're not just responsible for yourself in, in some sense. You know, obviously it's a, it's a team sport, no doubt. But um, at the same time, you know, you have a more global picture as, as a manager, as an owner. So was it um, more difficult back then when there was less assurance of just, you know, the day to day or, you know, am I going to get my next sponsor or is it now in trying to sustain it? I think it's twofold. I think certainly if you look at it from a, a driver's perspective, uh, obviously, which is what you, you know, I think strive to do when you're young and try to get to a point where if you're a professional racing driver, then you want to drive race cars and you want to win races. Um, a lot of things are out of your control. Obviously, you're only as good as the equipment you're sitting in or the people you have working for you. So that's the one oddity there is that really, you know, even if your equipment's not that great, you can try to, you know, press and, and create more things, but obviously that gets you in trouble lots of times. And I think those are the elements that you're out of your control as a race car driver. So you only can give input, you only can drive your heart out and everything else is really, you know, left to be. And as a team manager uh, or possibly an owner, right, I think you certainly look at it in a different perspective. Um, depends on on where you're at funding wise and obviously trying to run the, the thing within its means to where you're not losing money uh, and or um, and or making money or if you can and, and the competitive side the competitive nature I think as a as an owner you know you thrive you've been a driver so you really I think strive to put the best quality product you can on the racetrack each week both aesthetically optically 
and uh, competitively on the race car mechanically. And I think try to give the driver, which you've been before, the best opportunity to showcase his potential so that he can thrive and be a stable fixture in the sport. So I think the pressure comes for me to help you know, our driver and to help our team owners understand, have realistic expectations uh, in, the, in the atmosphere and the climate that we're in, and then you know, strive to be as competitive as we can, depending on the funding we have. I guess funding obviously, you know, is a huge aspect for drivers, you know, no matter what stage you're at typically. And, you know, as a, as a team owner, I guess what um, the message that I'm trying to, I'm, I'm receiving from you is that it's more of a, it's, it's a different kind of pressure, you know, as, as a driver, you have those pressures and a, as a team owner or a manager, you have those sorts of pressures. So it, it does vary, but um, it's not like one is significantly more than the other. No, I think you know, the intensity level is, I think if you're intense about racing and you have passion, and yep. you have hurt. I think it's the same. It touches those same emotions because it touches every emotion you have. So I think it's relative in that regard. Uh, obviously, uh, physically, it's it's definitely way more demanding and, and more pressure on you physically to perform at the high levels and to maintain the integrity of what you know the the race team expects of you. Uh, whereas you know on the other side, uh, you really have to look at it from the standpoint that the pressure uh, comes from you know, running the numbers and making sure that we can have the best possible parts and pieces and doing all the processes and making sure that I give, you know, my owners, my, my people and the driver the best uh, that I can provide, you know, within, within our means. Do you feel like you have a, a higher degree of control now? I've, I feel like I, I have a lot of control. Uh, obviously, um, where I'm at currently, um, my wife and I, Alicia, <clears throat> We pretty much run the team. Mike and Matt Kohler and Bill Waldman pretty much give us, you know, all the ability to make the decisions, and then we discuss it with them. So a lot of autonomy. I mean, that that's always, you know, good that they have that trust in you to to make the decisions and get cracking on it. I guess. And um, one of the one of the main aspects about uh, this whole journey, I guess, is the transition from you know being an individual driver where you have a team to now managing it. Now, for most people um, who are interested in the sport, you know, they're not drivers, but they might be hobby drivers. Um, what would you say is a, is a significant um, difference in the way you have to approach your, your day, your mentality towards the sport? Well, I think obviously I'm not very far removed from driving the race car. You know, last year I drove for the team. Uh, so it is still extremely hard for me to um, not be in the race car. And I have to really look at how my, my, my perspective is each week because there's times you want to be in the race car, you see things happening, you feel like that, you know, you see- it's changed it or done it better. Or I it could do it, you know, maybe I could do it better or maybe I feel like I would make different choices. So I have to be careful to try to draw a line between how I present those things or how I feel about things. So I, I guess sometimes at this stage, I do battle with myself to some degree in that regard, but I really try to maintain the integrity of what my position is. And I really try to look at what is best for the race team. And I make my comments and my suggestions uh, based on those things. Um, sometimes I don't do enough, sometimes I do too much. And I think that is the, the thing that I have to maybe myself learn and grow and become more confident and, and more, I guess, uh, pleased with, with myself. You know, I think those are the things that I, I struggle with the most. Uh, uh you just, you used to being a race car driver, you come in, you drive the race car and you leave, and then you come back the next day. And so now I'm, I'm in this thing with my wife, you know, 24 seven, we live and breathe it every week and uh, 36 weekends a year. And it is um, a lot to do. Yeah, not nonstop, I guess. And it's it's a fine balance, right, between um, doing too much or doing too little, I guess. And in that, I guess, um, stems the question, what makes you happy right now? I think uh, certainly being able to, you know, still be at the racetrack every week, uh, coming home and look forward to getting up in the morning and going to work, uh, which not a lot of people can really say that is true. Uh, and the chance to really be at the highest level of, uh, of motor racing and to be able to put a quality product on the racetrack uh, and strive to be better each week. And that's what makes me happy is to, to be at the race shop in the morning, 
and then leave for the racetrack uh, midweek, and then to see our our team uh, be at the rest racetrack, look aesthetically pleasing, perform well, and uh, and move forward, and and to give a quality, I think, um, perception in the marketplace for my owners. Uh, those things make me happy, and uh, you know uh, that's. That's what it, that's what it's about is making your self gratification. I think more so. I, I really find that um, what stood out there is the quality um, in the in the marketplace as well for the owners. Now that's something that obviously um, shows that you're not you're really fully part of the team. You know, hundred percent all in, and you know, really want to make this work for for the team and for everyone there. So, how did the how did you manage to feel like this is the team that you wanted to stay with because a lot of drivers a lot of people you know switch between teams and sponsors and all these sorts of things again and again and again that they don't really feel this sort of um closeness if you see what i mean this this sort of tight knitness that i'm feeling from you where you really want to make it work because you feel like this is yours rather than just another something to make you know it work or have another month in racing well i believe it was really, I think, uh, when, you know, Mike reached out to try to sponsor me first, it was really to help me, you know, drive because they were fans of mine as kids. And they reached out to help me, you know, continue to live my dream and to, to drive a race car. And then for them to ultimately want to own their own race team and me start it and give me the opportunity and my wife, uh, the opportunity to start a team from scratch for them. Um, that's, um, that's somebody putting a lot of blind faith, faith in you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I've always been one that I've been very driven my whole life. My work ethic is, you know, I think second to none. I mean, I will do whatever it takes to, to get the job done. And I think for them to, to be behind us as me as a driver first, I could sense that where the team needed to be, um, we needed to, you know, maybe put a, a a younger driver in the car, give them an opportunity, try to put us in a position where the team will be here long term. And uh, so we made choices which were hard uh, at that time. Uh, but, you know, yeah, my, my, I think Alicia and I, we both feel strongly about um, the Kohlers and, and Bill Wallman as individuals. Uh, they're like family. They treat us that way, uh, but they give us enormous amount of uh, opportunity to make very conscious decisions for the company spending their money and I take that seriously and so we try to we want to run this like it was our own where we don't take them for granted we don't give you know we, we really try to run the thing where we don't abuse them or their company and it is something of magnitude this is a major sports franchise and we want to showcase it in that manner and we want respect in the marketplace and I want them to be proud when they come that they see that they have a first class entity uh, that pretty much is self-reliant in every regard. And that's, that's where we're at. It's all about, um, about producing something for them. It's amazing. And a lot of people, I mean, they would, uh, you know, definitely not like to go to work with their wives. You know, you mentioned Alicia a few times and, you know, how you managed to make it work so that both of you are both in the same industry, in the same work place and, you know, still kind of um, keeping, your i guess some would say sanity you know together when you're you know up in each other's throats and faces all the time. <clears throat> well uh the one thing uh about alicia is uh, she comes from uh, a marketing background her father sponsored uh their company uh family business sponsored me as a driver at one point uh and I, she has enormous passion and i think she loves the sport as much as i do which i think is the uh the underlining tone. Uh, and we live and die by this. I mean, unfortunately, uh, that's the way you have to be in this sport. And we, we actually, right now, we build a new, I have a new building that we're still doing an upfit to. So Alicia and I share an office. So talk about everything. <laughs> we share an office. She sits over there. I sit here. And, uh, you know, then we leave here. We go to lunch. We go to the, we go back home. We go to dinner. So, and then we leave and we're in our own motor, we're in the motor coach, you know, and, you know, so we spend, you know, every waking moment together and sleeping. So, um, but you know what? We love each other. Uh, she, I, she loves what we're doing. Uh, we both have, you know, again, a, a deep passion to make sure that we provide a quality race team for our owners whom we love. And um, 
it's like one big family. So it's, it's, it's a lot easier when you really care and you're vested, you know, uh, it's hard for employees to be vested. A lot of times you'll have mm, yeah. a few that are right, but it's hard to get the bulk of the workforce to be vested the way that Alicia and I are. Right. So we find a group of people in the, in the deal, you know, that are in managerial roles that have that kind of passion and, and maybe have been in the sport a long period of time. And we will rely on them. But, um, I think you just, you know, you just have to love what you do. And we, and we do. Yeah. And it feels like you've really built a dream together, you know, and you work towards it together. So naturally, whatever comes along that journey, you're both prepared to take it on and enjoy the, enjoy the ride of it. And, um, it's, it sounds like, uh, I mean, I'm speculating here, but is this how you guys met through her marketing and them sponsoring, uh, you, and then that's how you met, or was this uh, another story to that? Yes, she was uh, going through a divorce okay, okay. and uh, at a race. Uh, she was doing marketing for her father's team. Okay. So what kind of errands or chores do you have to still do in daily life as a manager that people would be surprised that you still have to do yourself? Oh, uh, I think the one thing is, you know, I still do all the shock absorbers for the team. Mm -hmm. So uh, pretty much I come in and I have to, uh, you know, delegate authority, uh, you know, try to make sure that, I run for parts a lot of the times, um, you know, I, I kind of know what I need and I have to manage the budget. So I'm very cautious on our spending and what I do. So I make a lot of the choices on our, on our, uh, our parts, uh, purchasing, uh, uh, we'll go and get some parts if, if need be, uh, structure the cars, you know, getting work done if we do any outsourcing at all. Uh, but I also, you know, come uh, Monday, Tuesday, possibly sometimes early Wednesday, I'll be doing all the shock absorbers. Uh, trying to get the next week's versions uh, ready to go and then set up all the, you know, the bump springs uh, and everything on the shock so that we can uh, have those ready to go when we get to the racetrack. So uh, I have that expertise and that becomes part of my duties as well as managing the team. You mentioned uh, you had a company for shock absorbers as well, right? So naturally this is something of a, a personal interest. So naturally you do want to jump in and get your hands dirty with that. Now, and it, it sounds like, you know, with so much, you said almost four decades, right? 40 years of, uh, of experience. If you could do any race over again, what race would you choose and why, of course? I, you know, I would, I guess uh, the, probably if I had to pick a race, uh, probably would be the 1998 Daytona 500, uh, the Dale Earnhardt won, uh, because, you know, obviously, um, a lot has been said about, you know, my win, you know, and Dale Earnhardt having, you know, miscues and things. But I think 1998, I had a faster race car than Dale Earnhardt did. I had the uh, gum out car there with Bahari racing and our race car, I thought was second to none that day. And we were just lying there behind him and waiting and just running really well and uh, felt like that we had the car to beat. And I got hit on pit road, exiting the pits and uh, pretty much thwarted that effort. Uh, I honestly believed that I was going to win a second day 2500. I felt in my heart, uh, the car was there. I was up front. I uh, wasn't even pressing the car and felt like that that had an opportunity. So it would have been, it would have been interesting to see the end of that race and how that would have uh, played out, you know, if I had the opportunity. Multiverse theory. You never know. There's a, there's someone like you right there <laughs> already living that, that yeah. dream. So yeah, you never know, never know. But um, one last question, what, and, and ending on this, like looking back at your four year, 40 years, sorry, of, um, of racing and whatever um, companies to team management to owning you've done, how did you originally see this journey taking you? Where did you see it going? How did you see the trajectory of it in terms of where you would see yourself compared to where you are today? Uh, you know, it really stemmed from a discussion my father and I had uh, at a very early age and in infancy of my career. Uh, he was trying to say, well, you know, wh where do you think you want to go? What do you, do you want to drive Indy cars? Do you want to run stock cars? Uh, he was building engines for stock cars at that time and doing a lot of drag racing engines and things. So we uh, made a conscious decision to do stock car racing because, you know, he felt like he had real vision on, I think, where the corporate America was going to be, where it was going to go, uh, all those things. And he wanted me to be very well-rounded and drive as many race cars and things that I could and, you know, 
be a good representation of a company, uh, you know, an extension of the company. So took marketing classes, speech classes. So I think we saw that I wanted to be in um, stock car racing, NASCAR, uh, for a long period of time, be a stable fixture in the sport. And I think that's that's where it started, and that was the mindset. So you know, to be able to in ten year span from when I started driving a race car uh, to winning rookie of the year in the West coast grand national series, and then to go East and 10 years, win the Daytona 500 and be a stable fixture. And then, you know, that opened up opportunities to run, you know, a GTP car, 24 hours of Daytona, Ferraris, open cockpit, Lola's a lot of things. So it's been a wonderful ride and I've uh, been, you know, been given the opportunity to, uh, to do something I love for 40 years, which not a lot of people really get a chance to do. So, uh, it's been a life uh, fulfilled, and uh, I'm I'm very fortunate. That's, that's amazing to hear, and you know this is all topped off by having an amazing uh, you know wife, as you mentioned as well, Alicia, who's who's supported you and you know gone through this journey with you as well. So thank you for sharing your journey with us, and um, thank you for you know showing us also the the real kind of discipline that you've maintained and the almost like the ethical conduct as well throughout all of this um which which really comes through as well about your work ethic and your closeness of relationships to the team owners and the people around you and you know the closeness that you bring about through your relationship so thank you for that thank you so much and i've, I've enjoyed it thoroughly and uh, look forward to having another opportunity at some point If you like this episode of the Racecoin podcast, go ahead and subscribe so you can get notified every Monday when a new episode is out. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.